Coming up on Two and a Half Geeks, we're going to do a roundup of external storage, a ton of news out of IFA, plus we'll be talking about overclocking SSDs, that's a thing, and a whole lot more. The bar has been set wicked fast. It rocked in the benchmarks. We're going to up the ante uh, just a little bit. Processing power, I kind of understand this. Well, welcome back to Two and a Half Geeks. I'm Aya Zaktar, and alongside me are Dave Altavilla and Marco Cipetta. How are you guys doing, Dave? Oh, Dave's doing great, but his voice is only mediocre. I'm a little bit, little bit hoarse today, so you'll, you have to forgive my uh, Barry White impersonation. I'd make some mean jokes here, but you're not feeling so well, so we won't do that. How about you, Marco? Appreciate it. <laughs> I am doing fantastic. Cannot complain. Uh, we're recording on a Friday, so we're a few hours away from the weekend. I'm pretty psyched. Marco's already mentally checked out. That's good because I'm not even here, so this is fantastic. Let's start off. We're going to go really fast today, I think, potentially. Dave, there's an external storage roundup. Okay, so you got Lacy, Toshiba, Western Digital. How? I mean, I know there's an article up on hot hardware, but how sexy can this possibly be considering we're just talking about drives and, bu and big cases? Well, you made it sexy. I mean, I always thought it was Lacy. It's Lacy, and, and you're right with that capital C in there. <laughs> That's Very astute good. of you. Well, I believe it's French. Who says you're mentally checked out anyways? Everybody. Anyway, <laughs> hard drives. They're so, yeah, hard now. drives, uh, they are all USB 3. So if that, you know, turns your knobs at all, <laughs> they are uh, external storage that you need. And, yes, uh, to a certain extent, it's not sexy, uh, but uh, it's a necessity. It's smart. Uh, I think you experienced some sort of uh, data loss pain recently. We can talk about that. But we, we rounded up three offerings from uh, Lacie, Toshiba, and Western Digital, uh, three big names in storage. And they are external terabyte and 750 gig hard drives. We talk about features, performance, and price, which is important. And, you know, by gum, you can get, you know, a terabyte, a pocketable terabyte little gizmo that you can attach with USB and take your files anywhere, but more importantly, make up uh, backup copies of your files, and uh, that's what you should be doing because uh, save early and often, that's the rule, don't you know? Now, ha have these devices become commodity just yet? Because I know I still I, I panic uh, when I think of Max Tor, which I know Seagate bought, and I'm pretty sure the last drive I had, which was from Seagate, probably was from the Max Tor factory because it failed on me. Um, is there actually a difference at this point? Is there a difference in reliability? Yes. Yes, um, absolutely there is. And hard drive manufacturers have come a long way in um, designing and building hard drives to take the abuse of everyday life, whether it be in a notebook or one of these devices. Um, there's all sorts of technologies that, you know, they've engineered over the years from parking, you know, drive heads on the fly um, to, you know, all sorts of motion sensing and uh, impact sensing technologies built in. These drives specifically, you might, you might look at it from a spec standpoint and say, wow, that's, these aren't very impressive. They're only 5,400 RPM drives. But the reason they're 5,400 RPM drives is because at 7,200 RPMs, things become a little bit more delicate. Stuff's flying around a lot faster inside spindle speeds at that, uh, at that RPM, 7,200 RPM. Uh, it, it's you know moving around faster inside that thing, and so 5400 RPM drive, very conservative spindle speed spec, but also takes your reliability way up in terms of vibe and shock tolerance. So um, you know definitely something that you can trust these days. As a matter of fact, um, I talked to Seagate this week, and I can't really get into it because they're announcing some stuff in the next few days um, where hard drives are going to get even more mobile. Believe it or not, there's still life in these things, and they can take the abuse. Um, you know, SSDs are sexy, and it's where kind of the technology is going, but bulk storage is still a requirement, and a one terabyte SSD to back up your stuff is going to get darn expensive. These things, on the other hand, one terabyte drive for $99 uh, or less, $65 in the case of a 750 gig drive for Toshiba. So you're, you're just not going to touch that with solid state uh, and, um, you know, bulk storage on the, on the, on the fly. These, these drives can, uh, can put it up there for you. So we move on to the world of Intel. Uh, it turns out that there's an article up in Hot Hardware about the Ivy Bridge eCPU. Now, this confuses me, Marco, because I'm pretty sure that Intel moved on to Haswell. Why is there another Ivy Bridge when it seems like, you know, Intel likes to go forward? 
So that, that little E on the end of the code name is the hint. Ivy Bridge E is the core used in the new Extreme Edition processor. The specific model is the Core i7-4960X. So the Ivy Bridge E is the successor to 2011's Sandy Bridge E. And the Extreme processors are typically about a, a half step behind the mainstream chips in Intel's release cadence. So Haswell is the latest core. It's used on the mainstream parts, the fastest of, fastest of which is the Core i7-4770K. Haswell's also used in a ton of lower power mobile devices and Ultrabooks now. But Ivy Bridge E is a completely different animal. It's a giant chip. It's a six core chip, 15 megs of cache. It's for the LGA 2011 socket. Um, the particular chip we tested, the flagship, has a base clock of 3.6 gigahertz, and it turbos up to 4 gigahertz. It has hyper-threading, so those six cores can process up to 12 threads at a time. So what all that should tell you is these chips are for highly parallel, um, multi-threaded workloads where all those additional cores are going to come in handy, and it can just crank through stuff faster than Haswell with those type of workloads. So it seems like it's it, this particular, uh, this Intel Ivy Bridge E, this is for a particular kind of usage. So for the general public, Haswell probably the way to go for everything else? For the general public, I would say absolutely Haswell's the way to go. Um, you're going to find cheaper versions of the processor, cheaper motherboards, cheaper platforms. Um, to get the most out of Haswell, you don't need as much expensive hardware. Now, for example, um, the Core i7-4960X requires an X79 motherboard, which right there makes it more expensive, but it also has a quad-channel memory controller. And to get the most of it, the official top speed is 1866 megahertz. So if you want to let this chip you know, fully stretch its legs, you need an expensive motherboard, a quad-channel memory setup of at least 1866 megahertz. But when you do that, what you end up with is the fastest platform Intel has released to date. It's not a huge step forward over Sandy Bridge E. Um, in the same way, the Ivory Bridge core wasn't a giant step forward over Sandy Bridge E in terms of performance. The same is true with um, Ivory Bridge E versus Sandy Bridge E. However, you, it is a little bit faster, faster memory um, or faster memory subsystem, faster clocks overall, lower power as well because it's a smaller die comprised of fewer transistors and also built on a more advanced process. It's built on Intel's 22 nanometer process versus the 32 nanometer process used on Sandy Bridge E. So overall, it's a, a slight step forward over Sandy Bridge E in terms of performance, um, but it is a technologically superior chip. You're, you're kind of buying into a somewhat older platform, but if you want the best of the best um, and have the budget to afford a $1,000 processor, which is essentially what this is, then Ivy Bridge E is a beast. It's a, an absolute killer chip. Shall we move on to the world of IFA <laughs> now? I'm moving through these really fast because I know we got well, a time crunch. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this you real quick because I, yes, I have a bone to pick with, uh, with Intel. Um, uh -oh. Intel announced recently that they're getting out of the, uh, the motherboard business. Um, over, over a certain amount of years, they've seen a decline and decided to exit it. And they released this new chip, this Sandy Bridge E chip. And Marco and I were kicking this around earlier this week. And Marco, you can share your thoughts on it as well. But Intel decided, in their infinite wisdom, we're going to release this new big, fast, honking, performance enthusiast catering, uh, workstation enthusiast catering chip called Sandy or Ivy Bridge E, excuse me. And we're not going to release updates for our existing motherboards in the install base in the market to support our new chip. So folks out there with an X79 motherboard from Intel, the maker of that new chip, you're not going to get a BIOS that supports that new chip. How do you feel about that? I'm a little ticked off, personally. <laughs> I don't get ticked off easy, by asking, the way. Are you asking me or asking IS? I'm asking you, Marco. Yeah, you build stuff. So I, I don't build stuff I anymore. Think, I, think that, I think that move sucks, um, plain and simple. If, if you are a diehard Intel fan and you bought into, let's say, their Siler motherboard, which is a really beautiful X79 motherboard, um, hoping to have the ability to upgrade in the future when the next core came out, you're probably really pissed. The flip side to that is most enthusiasts I know, and I, I'm, you know what, I have to back up. I, I'm not giving Intel a pass. I think it does suck. They, they have the resources to release. <laughs> Don't BIOS give them a pass. pass. <laughs> what, what did I say? You, you said, I'm not giving them a pass. It does suck. Just, well, just it, 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 it does. It's, it does, period. 
However, most enthusiasts I know um, would be buying a motherboard from a third party like Asus or MSI or Gigabyte. Um, plus, I don't know a ton of enthusiasts that when they upgrade, they just upgrade a part. You know, I'm a psycho. When I upgrade, I, I replace tons of parts, you know, maybe a whole system. And I think a lot of guys are like me. When they want to upgrade, they're going to inch everything forward, not just their processor. So I don't know. They, they don't, announced they were yeah. leaving the motherboard business. There's kind of a gray area. It stinks if you bought into it, but what are you going to do? I, I think it's I think it's a cold move. I think it would take Intel a sneeze to to rev their their BIOS with a microcode update. I think it's I think it's almost a snub, and and I think they need to listen uh, if they're watching this right now and release an update for their motherboards. You're not gonna if you bought an X79 motherboard back in the day for Cine Brigi or for the high end of Intel's lineup back then. And, and you bought an Intel motherboard, and there's lots of folks out there. Intel did big business in motherboards. Then you're going to want an upgrade path to the next thing. And, and if you bought that high-end board from Intel, chances are you want to keep supporting it with future high-end chips. And I, I think they owe it to the community that they were thumping hard so long. Remember the, remember the big skull on the motherboard? You know, the, the performance enthusiast, the you know targeted features that they put into those motherboards with all that branding? Well, now they're kind of just thumbing their nose to it. Oh, we're out of the motherboard business. We're not going to update the microcode. It's a simple update and, um, and a little bit of validation. It doesn't take a whole lot, and it would go a whole, a whole long way with the community. So All right, Let's see if we can calm everybody down. with the EFA <laughs> news. We saw that there's, there's a Samsung Galaxy Gear smartwatch. It's real, 300 bucks. There's a new tablet, thinner. I think it's got like a leatherette for fake back, uh, backing on it. There's some weird funky laptops out there xiaomi which is hard to say because i don't speak chinese has this awesome phone lots of things going on in the past couple of days with products that are going to hit consumers hands where do we start guys so we might as well start with samsung and uh because they had a big day they had three product uh, announcements um sort of that all work together uh the galaxy gear uh smartwatch of course and the galaxy note 10.1 the the next iteration of their 10 inch tablet and the Galaxy uh, Tab 3, or is it the Galaxy Note 3? I always get the notes and tabs mixed up. Marco, is it the Galaxy Note 3? Galaxy Excuse Note 3 uh, yeah. tablet and Galaxy Note 10.1 2014 edition tablet. So I got the pens. Yes, yes. Pens so um, good stuff from Samsung. Um, really impressive specs. Um, the 10.1 actually has a 2560 by 1600 display um, and an octa-core processor. Um, and the um, Note 3, also uh, an octa-core processor and a uh, very high-res display there. I'm not so sure about the Galaxy Gear smartwatch. I mean, it's interesting. You know, you can do all sorts of things with it. It's certainly, you can set, you know, alarms, and it will relay or uh, stream in your incoming text and emails um, and also relay those to the tablet. It's meant as a companion device. Uh, to the Note 3, um, but um, for me, it just seems like overkill. I, I don't know about you guys. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about the utility of this thing. Um, you can take videos uh, with it, you know, sort of jot video memos with it. Um, I, I don't know. It, it looks cool, um, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so impressed on the utility of it just yet. I think it has a lot of future potential. Now, Mark, yeah, you I tried it out, right? Yeah, I was actually at Samsung's event in New York. So just a, one quick correction. The Galaxy Note 3 has an, an octal-core in the international version. The U.S. version with LTE is a quad-core. Um, as for the, the Galaxy Gear, yeah, I'm kind of, I don't know. I think I'm indifferent towards smartwatches at this point because I, I haven't had enough experience to to realize the, the utility of them. Are they going to be useful? I know I've chatted with some friends who've been dying to get a smartwatch because they they don't want to pull their phone out of their pocket just to see what the latest notification was. Um, the build quality of all the devices seemed really cool. You know, I felt them. I had them in my hand. I was swiping through some of the apps and using them. They all are definitely fast and speedy. The build quality is there. The features are there. I'm not sure I dig the textured backs on the new phone and tablet, but I, I need to have more time. Uh, specifically speaking to the gear, um, it's really snappy. The screen is nice. It's got some cool features. I think Samsung's going to have to expand the connectivity to other devices. Right now, they've only announced the Note 3. And it's only going to have 70 apps at launch, so there's going to need to be some software development. But 
for a first effort, I, I think they're on an interesting path. It could lead to something. Yeah, that device is going to cost, the gear is going to cost $300. As you mentioned, yeah. limited functionality with a particular Samsung devices at, at launch anyway. Uh, and by the way, I, as, as a person who's used an S3 and an S4, any backing that is not that ridiculous shiny plastic would be better because those things just fly out of my hand. I look like an infomercial person <laughs> with an S2 or 3 or whatever. They just they slide out. I don't know what it is. Anything is an improvement on that, but there's also yeah, Mar a lot more. Marco was at the show. Marco, did you get a chance to feel that pleather on the backside of the uh, 10.1 and the, and the Note 3? Yeah, if I'm perfectly honest, my first initial few-second impression was ill. But, <laughs> you know, it's like I see what they're trying to do. They take a lot of flack in the media because all the Apple fanboys are complaining about the plastic back on Samsung devices, blah, blah, blah. But... I'm not sure this move was the best one. I really, I'm really, i not sure. I, I'm not going to make a decision until I've held it and used it for much longer. See, now I've tried a Motorola products that have plastic backs as well, and even the Moto X has a, a textured back. Or, and some HTC devices, LG, a ton of them do plastic, and they do it differently than SGs. I don't know if it's just Apple, by the way. It's uh, Even Apple did yeah. a plastic back. It was called the 3G, and they're going to have one pretty soon next week. That's the rumor. But that's all rumor <laughs> crap. We should go back to IFA stuff. I got to tell you that the one thing that was exciting for me out of that launch was the Note 10.1 and its WQXGA resolution screen, 2560 by 1600 screen. That thing's got to be gorgeous because God knows Samsung knows how to make panels and a 1.9 gigahertz octa-core processor under the hood too. So um, that's no joke and that looks like a pretty powerful tablet. Yeah, it, se it seemed pretty nice when... If you sit and look, obviously you can definitely see the differences in screen in screen quality, but from you know what a couple feet away versus a 1920 by 1080 screen, not sure the human eye is really going to pick up the differences. But I don't know, like I said, we'll see when we test it. Marco yeah. doesn't like pretty things apparently. No, no, I, I'm actually I'm psyched. <laughs> they're they're really really cool devices. It, it just I don't know. I, I should be extremely excited because I have a Note 2 and I'd be psyched to have a Note 3. I'd love to upgrade. Um, and so I'm not sure that huge leap step forward was there. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll have to see. I mean, I, I think Samsung does a real nice job with panels. and um, But, you know, they, they had some pretty cool stuff. And, and a bunch of other folks came out this week as well. Asus came out at EFA with uh, a bunch of offerings and tablets and, and notebooks and convertibles. Uh, you've got the Transformer Book Trio, which is a detachable, you know, tablet, uh, notebook, uh, or ultrabook sort of uh, convertible uh, that has a full Haswell-based um, Windows 8 PC in the keyboard. And then in the tablet, uh, in the screen itself, there's an Android-based um, Atom-driven, Intel Atom-driven uh, tablet. So that's pretty impressive kind of like that so here you can have the best of both worlds it'll it'll dual boot so android or windows 8 uh you know on boot up you can select that option and uh and again sort of a a, a three-in-one tablet um and or notebook uh with either operating system uh as an option 11.6 uh, inch display there um they also have the transformer book t um let's see the transformer what do they call it? Transformer Book T300. Um, that's running a Core i7 45, uh, 4500 Haswell chip and uh, 8 gig of RAM and a 256 gig SSD. And then they've got the Transformer Pad TF701T. Now, this one's interesting to me, Marco. I don't know if you got a, uh, uh, got a chance to check this out, but Tegra 4 under the hood and a very high end 2560 by 1600 display as well. Uh, really nice with the Transformer Pad TF701T. I tried to have the TC300, the previous edition, and that was a really well-built machine, but it was running the, uh, I think it was Ivy Bridge. I've been looking forward to that Haswell processor in that because it was just a just a great piece of hardware if you like Windows 8 laptops, which are going to get a lot better pretty soon with Windows 8.1. Uh, do you guys have any excitement over the, the Xiaomi uh, phone, the MI3 or Mi3? It'll be interesting to see what um, and, and or if that company brings something to the U.S. That that device is uh, intended for um, certainly the Asian market, um, but no availability announced yet. Um, it's interesting to see Tegra 4 in a smartphone. 
I think Tegra 4i is sort of where NVIDIA is going. Marco, I don't know what your thoughts are there with uh, their smartphone chip. Uh, Tegra 4 really more of a, uh, a higher-end device, tablets and things like that, uh, uh, targeted SOC. But 4i is kind of uh, the path that I think NVIDIA is on. Um, but yeah, it was an interesting, interesting uh, announcement. And I guess you can. There's also an option for that device with a Qual Qualcomm Snapdragon 800 as well. Yeah, I, I agree with what Dave was saying. The, the Tegra 4 used in that device, as we saw in the Shield, it can be a super, super fast chip. You know, the Shield was technically the fastest tablet we've ever tested um, for the U.S. market with LTE and everything that's happening here. I think Tegra 4i is going to be the important product for Nvidia. But yeah. we'll, we'll we'll see in time. Not not much news to report just yet. Any other crazy things happening in the past week with those uh, with like different weird laptops or anything else, or is that everything? Well, there's there's one more I'd mention. The ZenBook series, the UX three hundred one and three hundred two, mm -hmm. pair of really high end ultra books by ASUS. Again, really impressed with them. Here you've got Haswell on board. You've got things like a five twelve gig SSD RAID zero array, and and also interesting, and I'm, this is going to be interesting to feel, you know, whether or not we get that ooh, that Marco experience, that ew, that Marco experience with uh, the pleather on the, on the Galaxy uh, products. Here you've got notebooks that are draped in Corning Gorilla Glass on the on the lid. I wonder what that's going to feel like. And <laughs> and I know it's going to add some glassy. <laughs> Didn't HP try this already? They had this one of their NVs, and they said like it supposedly helps with like the radio transmissions because it was on the back cover. It just seems like it's fingerprint magnet like device, and then you have extra weight because glass isn't particularly light. So why bother right. with that? Yeah, it really depends at what what it's going to feel like. Is it going to be a fingerprint magnet, or do they do something with the the color or, or some sort of texture underneath that that hides fingerprints? I don't know. Carbon fiber. Yeah, interesting though. Carbon fiber is the future, I think. Screw this glass stuff. Agreed. I like carbon fiber a lot. Carbon fiber, light, strong, sturdy, and it lets radio transmissions through it. Uh, what? You know, I saw the lineup, and I saw this weird thing that Mark was going to talk about. It says overclocking SSDs, which <laughs> yes. I'm like, they're I didn't know if there was a typo, if he had, it was going to do like an overclocking processor or a GPU or something. But no, it actually is about overclocking SSDs. Okay, explain to me what's going on, Marco. Sounds risky. So, so it's coming. We just had a, a, a new team member out at PAX, and he saw this demo by Intel um, of, of SSD overclocking. So I'm going to be out at IDF next week, and I'm going to see this up close and get to ask some questions and really get to the bottom of it. But here's the gist. So through Intel's extreme tuning utility, the utility that's included with some of their motherboards are available for download um, from their site, there are now or there, or there are going to be sliders available where you can tweak the clock speed of the NAND used in an Intel SSD um, or the controller. And I'm not sure exactly which SSDs this is going to be. Maybe it's new ones. I'm not quite clear just yet. But basically, you can crank up the speed of the controller or and or crank up the speed of the NAND and increase the overall performance of the SSD. Now, when you overclock, you obviously increase heat output. You may decrease the longevity of the devices. But SSDs don't particularly get too hot as long as it's cooled. And I'm sure Intel's not going to allow you to fry the thing with a slider. So it could just be an easy means to boost performance of an SSD for those that are feeling adventurous. Yeah, we had talked about, I think a long time ago, an episode with it on this show, we are talking about SSDs and how, how uh, what a difference firmware can make actually in performance, which actually surprised me because it just doesn't seem like something you think of. But this idea of being able to get more power out of an SSD, it, it seems to make sense based on what we know about processors and GPUs. Marco, are you thinking that people are going to be excited by this? Is this going to get people to buy particular brands of SSDs? Or are they just going to figure out how to overclock the crappy brands too? You know, I don't know. See, SSDs are still relatively new in, mm -hmm. in, in terms of you know computing hardware. So there's still an air of questionability, if that's a real word, about their you know, long-term reliability, they, they should be more reliable than hard drives. There's no moving parts. There's tons of work been put into endurance, but there's still a fear by some users that, you know, maybe an SSD is not going to survive long-term. And I don't think uh, lots of folks are going to be comfortable overclocking it and potentially making it worse. But I don't know. I mean, enthusiasts are all about extreme performance. So 
if you want to crank things up and you want to have the fastest system possible, faster than anything you can buy because you're pushing it beyond spec, then yeah, I think some guys are going to experiment. SSDs are getting cheap enough now where maybe some guys are comfortable cranking things up. You know, but again, this yeah, is another one I, of those I, things where I haven't made up my mind yet. <laughs> it, it's an interesting concept, and I think I think that's what we would want to underscore for the folks here watching is that it, it's a con, it's a concept, proof of concept, uh, sort of vehicle right now. And I and I think I don't know. I'm I'm sort of the glass is half uh, empty here on this one because you're talking about a product that already offers an order of magnitude performance increase over um, standard spinning media. I mean, it's just like night and day going to an SSD from a hard drive. And But really what you're talking about are performance gains in, on the order of 20%, 30% um, when you overclock these things. And, and that's a substantial performance gain, certainly when you're talking about things like processor speed, and and general memory bandwidth but when you're already going you know to that you know level that that echelon of of performance that an ssd provides you versus a standard hard drive it's like do you reach a point of diminishing returns when when you're talking about your data you're you're overclocking your data stream here or your your file system and um i don't know i, I i'm having a tough time getting comfortable with that i'd say it's fast enough. Leave it alone, you know? I have a feeling Marco's going to do this anyway. Even <laughs> well, though it's you, nice I'll, to do I'll it. Do it. And I'll, so you I'll did. do it. I may not do it in my personal rig, right. but I'll be doing it. <laughs> there's actually a full <laughs> – there's, there's a session at, at IDF where Intel's going to talk about this. It's not just something in passing we're going to see in a demo. They're doing a session on overclocking SSDs, so something's going to happen with this somewhere. It's, we'll know soon enough. Definitely interesting to look at for sure. So, Dave, last time we talked a little bit about the Moto X. I, I hear there's a, an update on the website about the Moto X. You got a full review now? Yes, we have a full review of the Moto X. We deemed it recommendable, and um, it, is, uh, it, it, it fell just short of an editor's choice. I mean, there's, there's certainly something to be said for the device, and Google and the folks at Motorola have sort of shown you what's possible now with the technology at hand. Um, beyond just the standard smartphone features that we're so used to seeing today, they went a little bit outside the box with, with the uh, voice control and, and some of the other features they built into the device. So they get kudos for that for sure. It is an excellent, well-built phone. Um, is it the absolute editor's choice, you know, sort of uh, award-winning phone that, that we'd hoped for? Mm, not quite. Maybe some might think that way. But it's a, it's a well-built, well-made phone worthy of your consideration. And uh, check out the full review for, for all the details. So if they wanted this review somewhere on the web, you said it's on it's, it's hothardware.com. Is that what it is? Did you, <laughs> is, that, is that what it is? Hothardware.com? Yes, sir. That, yes, that would be how you would say it. What if they wanted to find it on Twitter, Marco? Where, where could they go? Uh, it's twitter.com slash hothardware. You know, Follow I'm, us. I'm, I'm really lazy. I like to watch videos. I really like videos. Uh, you guys got have any videos like a like a thing on YouTube? Yes, yes. Uh, subscribe <laughs> if you're looking around our channel right now, watching this on YouTube. Subscribe to YouTube.com/slash Hot Hardware Vids. Right. Vids right. on the end. We got like tricky it. there. It's, subscribe it's to that channel. The place. Uh, there's all, you know there's sometimes I'm not this I, like I said this before I'm not the social maven that that Marco is you know he's always if you're on Facebook and you're following Marco you know he's he's constantly making amazing looking breakfasts but sometimes <laughs> when I'm looking at breakfast I'm like you know I could really I could really go for some hot hardware Hi, can I do that too Marco you can at facebook.com slash hot hardware hey it's really and, great to be here <laughs> and sometimes I feel like hula hooping I like being in circles so I go to Google plus you guys there too you got to do a little work. You got to just search hot hardware because we don't have the vanity URL yet, but it's coming. Uh, I'm I'm thumping my friends at Google to say, hey, hook us up. He's thumping but yes, them. find us. Google Googleplus.com slash gobbledygook. <laughs> I don't know where that's going to lead you, but we're going to find well, out soon sh enough. It should be Google Google.com slash plus hot hardware. That would be. Ultimately, the vanity URL you'd find us at, but right now you got to search for us. Gonna, yeah, you have to use that Google thing to search. I, I know that's unfamiliar for everybody. <laughs> I think they'll do fine. Uh, I think that wraps it up for us, unless there's anything you folks have to say to the audience. Do you? Thanks for stopping by. And I'm enjoying talking in my infomercial voice.
Awesome. We'll see everybody <laughs> next week.